Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to Real Talk, Real Deals, stories and tips from the real world of sales. This is a podcast where we are talking about how to be successful in selling. This is episode seven, and I'm your host, Andrea Grudnitsky. Today, we're continuing our discussion from our last podcast on emotional intelligence in sales. Uh, and I'm thrilled to welcome back our guest, Becky Cassily. Becky is a highly sought after sales coach and trusted advisor to some of the largest sales organizations around the world. Welcome back, Becky. Oh, thanks, Andrea. It's great to be here. So Becky, in our last podcast, of course, we talked about emotional intelligence in sales. It's a meaty topic. And when we say emotional intelligence in sales, we're really talking about the ability to manage both your own emotions, right? And understand the emotions of people around you. And you and I talked a lot about why it's so important in sales to have emotional intelligence. I'm wondering for our listeners, Becky, if you could briefly recap that for us, why it's so important to have emotional intelligence in, in sales and share any additional reflections you might've had. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. So, you know, if you remember, Andrea, what we talked about was how, um, you know, when we're in sales and we start to think about, you know, how we want to uh, position ourselves, we tend to think about the logical argument for why our solution is a best fit for a client. And we think, you know, I hear expressions from sellers all the time, things like, you know, it's a no brainer or you can't argue with that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think what we fail to realize sometimes is that it binds an emotional journey, right? Yes, logic plays a part in it. Um, in fact, there was a, some data that showed that the majority of our decisions are not only made based on emotion, but then we retrofit logic to justify it, you know? And I think I can think of a million purchases I've made that I, I can give you a justification, but the truth is I just wanted it, you know? And and the logic is, is sort of backed in to my buying decision. And so, you know, understanding that dynamic is critical for sellers. It's not just about the, the business case itself, which is critical. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's not important, um, but it's about the buyer experience and being able to support them through that emotional buying journey. Yeah, that, it's so true, Becky, too, because I feel like, you know, we think about emotions playing a part more in you know, a, a consumer purchase, you know, and I think sometimes, particularly for salespeople who work in B2B, you know, business to business type selling situations, those business buyers, you know, they're more logical, but that just isn't the case, right? We're all humans and, and, and the, the emotional side does really play an important part. Right. I mean, think about it, right? Like a huge factor in a buying decision is risk, right? Like, mm -hmm. am I making the right decision? Is this person being upfront with me? Is this solution going to perform the way they claim it's going to? You know, there's a lot of emotion that goes about my job could be on the line. The organization could be looking at me if this goes south. And so there's a lot more than just, okay, it, I logically see it's a good fit. Therefore, I'll open my checkbook. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah, you talk about you know risk. It's such an important consideration. Um, and I, I the word that's coming to mind for me then is trust. You know, your buyers need to trust you, right? Right, right. I mean, are you going to buy something from someone you don't trust? One hundred percent, no. <laughs> right. I mean, it's it's so yeah. simple. And yeah, and yet, um, I think. You know, if I ask sellers like, okay, what's really important in order to help a buyer make a buying decision, they'll say, oh, trust. And I'm like, okay, great. Why is that so important? And, you know, they'll be able to sort of academically answer it. But then when we start executing exercises, what I see is this lack of focus on the experience they're creating and the small things they're doing that erode that trust. Yeah. Oh, that's it's such an important point. And actually, you know, thinking about trust, this is really at the crux of why you and I love talking about emotional intelligence in sales, right? Because I think people inherently maybe want to build trust, but actually building skill at doing that, um, you know, it actually is something you can do. And so let's jump into that a little bit. Yeah. You know, last time we spoke, you mentioned those six skills that you coach teams on to demonstrate that, you know, emotional intelligence and build trust. And those skills were presence, relating, questioning, listening, positioning, and checking. And we covered presence and relating in, in some depth uh, on our previous podcast, but I'd love for us to move on maybe to the next two, questioning and listening. And 
you know, saying those words, they seem pretty straightforward to me, Becky, but I'm guessing that they really aren't. Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, it seems so simple. Um, you know, where do you want to start, Andrea? I'd be happy to dig deeper because these are uh, two of the core skills that just show up regardless of where you are uh, in a customer's buying journey. We are going to lean on these two skills so heavily. So yeah. where do you yeah. want to start? Let's, well, let's start with questioning, I think. And, you know, some people call it discovery, but really at the, the end of it, it's, it's all about asking good questions, right? But, you know, I've heard you talk a little bit about this before as well. It's not just what you ask, but how you do it as well. So can you just break down this skill of questioning a little bit more for us? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny when we work with sellers, I'll always ask them, okay, give me a definition, right? If I asked you to define what questioning, you know, what's its role in the sales dialogue? It, without fail, I get it's to uncover needs, it's to gather information, it's to understand your client. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the answer is yes, it is. And, right, and this is the big and, and we've got to expand the way we think about questioning, right? It's not just to uncover needs, understand our client, get information, because quite frankly, Andrea, I could do that by interrogating you, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What a great not, experience. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> not quite the outcome I would be hoping for. Um, but its job is actually to create conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's kind of a different twist on the way we think about what what is questioning. You know, we think about it as understanding needs. And that part's important. You know, I don't want to downplay it. And that's what we mean when we say what you ask matters, but how you ask it matters as well. I can either create defensiveness in you by asking you questions that are either antagonistic or manipulative in nature, mm. or I can build trust with you by creating a dialogue so that you have a partner in your buying journey that can help you make a buying decision, not sell or stuff a logical argument down your throat that you can't push back on. Oh, it's such, that's such a, an important point, Becky, and a, I think a bit of a, a hot topic and discussion, you know, certainly in our industry, you know, this, this concept of leading questions, you know, teaching people to lead the customer down a path. I mean, can you expand on that a little bit? Because I, I love this idea of, you know, create, create a conversation, right? That's really what you're trying to do. Yeah. I, you know, the, the leading questions kill me, right? Like this isn't yeah. a game of Simon says, and they're accidentally <laughs> going to buy from you because they forgot to like, you know, listen for the right prompt. You know, it's, it's, it's a really weird, concept, you know, I, there's a couple of things, you know, and I know we talk a lot about this, the, the brain science behind a lot of the best practices that we work with. But you know, there's something called self determination theory, which of course, is about like, like, motivation, like human self motivation. Um, and when we ask those manipulative or leading questions, we are taking away somebody's sense of autonomy, which is so critical to them feeling confident and good about the buying journey and making a buying decision. And so what it ends up doing is creating um, a sour client experience. And even if we do end up getting the sale, like congratulations, you won the battle, but you lost the war because they're immediately having buyer's remorse or looking for alternative solutions. There's brand damage by word of mouth about the experience experience, hmm. you know, those leading questions, they, they may take you to where you want them, but if they don't want to be there or don't enjoy the journey, it's going to cost you more in the long run than the sale nuts you to begin with. Yeah. And I mean, you know, couldn't agree more, but, and, and we're not saying you don't need a roadmap and a plan for your questions, right? I mean, that's, you do, you are trying to, to get somewhere. Yes. Yes, but but again, it's how you ask it, not what you ask. I mean, what you ask matters, but how you phrase it makes all the difference. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, Andrea, have you ever had somebody um, start a question by saying to you, well, now let me ask you this, <laughs> right? Like, what yeah. instantly was your reaction when you heard that? Where are we going with this one? Or, you know, you, you, you yeah. sound a... Yeah, I uh, actually a little bit hesitant to even hear your question. Yeah, you, you're instantly guarded and defensive, right? Like my walls are up because I think, okay, you're going to ask me something that's either challenging the way I'm thinking, um, or you're going to ask me something to try to expose me for being naive or ignorant, right? Either way, I am waiting for the other shoe to fall when you say that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
a hundred percent. Well, can you talk a little bit more then Becky about, you know, if we know we need a roadmap and goodness, you and I could probably do an entire uh, podcast on just the types of questions you should ask, but yeah. let's focus on the how. Yeah. What are what are some of the things that that people need to do in terms of that the how demonstrating yeah. like really good questioning? Yeah. Um, so you know, I think one of the things that um, we need to do, and we don't think a lot about this when we are preparing our questions, is we have to preface them, right? And and that sounds so simple, right? Um, it, but Andrea, like, how much money do you make? All right, don't answer that. That was so invasive <laughs> and so inappropriate. Um, obviously, that question needs context, right? Like, I, I can't just blurt out a sensitive question and expect somebody to not pause and be like, hold on a second. Like, why do you need to know that? Uh, why should I share that information with you? So if I needed to know something sensitive like that, I would need to give you a, a reason to answer me, right? Like I would need to give you clear line of sight into my intentions and give you um, some sort of incentive to answer that. So I either need to preface that with a benefit to you um, or I need to share information with you about why, you know, why we need that so that you would feel more comfortable in providing me that, right? That does two things. It reduces your defensiveness and it goes from interviewing somebody to having a dialogue with them, to having a conversation, right? If I can give you that context for why I'm asking you things. So, you know, that's one thing that we really work with our with our customers, you know, and our clients with is, you know, okay, when you ask something like that, what possible ways might somebody interpret your intentions? Because you've got to be crystal clear with what they are. Otherwise, you're going to have a breakdown in trust. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it does seem obvious, but I'm, I'm guessing it's pretty, pretty tough to do. And I imagine maybe people are good at using prefacing with really tough questions and tripping over themselves to explain why they're asking it. But even, even every day, you know, need and discovery type questions could use some prefacing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, anytime that you can think about this as a dialogue, I mean, you think about um, how you're asking me questions. You're not just blurting them out, right? Yeah. You're setting them up. You're giving me context. You're letting, you know, anyone who's listening to this know why we're talking about it and what the context of it, and how it fits into this dialogue. So it makes it way more natural. It's just how we communicate um, normally, we don't normally just blurt out questions with no context and no setup to them. So yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I imagine one place it's super important too, is when you're talking to really senior people. So I'd love to talk about questioning in the context of, you know, having a, a conversation with a C-level executive as an example. So, I mean, one of the things I've certainly observed is, you know, C-level executives, they don't have a lot of time, uh, or tolerance for questions, right? So, you know, what's the coaching you give reps? What should they do in that scenario if they still need to get, they still need to ask some questions. So what are the best practices there? Yeah, you know, the, it, it's interesting and it really just boils down to preparation, right? Because there's this, this sweet spot when it comes to sea level. And so, um, like, I, I always think of things in terms of like an airplane fl flying, right? Like 30,000 feet, you know? Um, primarily, most information about organizations at the 30,000 foot level is publicly available. Yeah. Right. Like, um, you know, whether it's through listening to earnings calls, reading annual reports, just going on their website and looking at mission and vision, right? Like all that 30,000 foot information is out there. And so look, Andrew, you're part of our C-suite. Like what if I, like, you don't have a lot of time. If I got on your calendar and I sat down and the very first thing I said to you is tell me about your strategic goals. What would you <laughs> say to me? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know that I'd be open to sharing them with you yet. I don't necessarily, if I didn't know you, right? Uh, I, you know, we haven't built up that trust. And, you know, I feel like I'm, I'd be spending my time educating you. And why the heck should I do that? Right. I mean, first of all, um, you don't know me enough to share it. Or you might say, here, go to our website and read them. 
right? Yeah. Like they're out there. We've made public commitments or whatever that might be, right? Uh, here's where you can figure out who we are. Like, why are you wasting my time with information that you could have before you got here? All right. Yeah. So on the flip side, right? Like if I said to you, you know what, Andrea, I know that, you know, your role is really fueled by uh, data. And so I'm wondering if you could break down to me, um, you know, the volume and file size that you tend to use on a daily basis. Yeah. My, I mean, again, there you are giving me, you know, a little bit of context. It shows you've done some of your homework and it's a more, you know, targeted question that gives me a little bit of reason to answer. Yeah. But I think you would tell me, don't talk to me, talk to the people on my staff. Right. That, that is was, true too. That yeah. was way too granular, you yeah. know, on the flip side. And so probably you were like, okay, Becky, is that an example of a good question? Cause I'm not sure where you're going here. Right. <laughs> yeah. like, and and the, the answer is no. Right. And that's what I mean when I say there's like this sweet spot for this, for the C-suite, which is, mm -hmm. you know, you get too granular granular, you get pushed down in the organization. And once you're pushed down, it is really hard to get invited back. Yeah. Right? Uh, because you are, you know, their perception of you and they anchor around this idea that you are better suited to talk to folks who are more in the weeds or more dealing with the day to day operations or the technical aspects. If you go to pie in the sky, um, you're wasting their time. You know, because yeah. that information is public. And so there's this sweet spot about, um, you know, the type of information that you would want to engage in. And it sits somewhere in that space in between the granular and, you know, the visionary, right? Like, let's, let's, let's figure out what that sweet spot is. And then creating a dialogue around it so that that C-suite employee views you as a collaborative and valuable partner and consultant is very different than just mining them for information. Yeah, I think too, you know, this this sort of idea of sweet spot makes a lot of sense. And talking to me, at least about outcomes, you know, that I care about, like metrics that are important to me, things that I get, you know, measured on, uh, I, you know, that is always a place I, I am always pretty open to, to discussing when asked the question in the right way. Yeah, I mean, you like hit the nail on the head. What we advise clients all the time is you need to think about what this person is hired, fired, and measured on. Those are mm -hmm. the things that matter. Yep, yep, 100%. Well, okay, so let's, um, I, I know some people probably, you know, are curious about, you know, what you see out there when you're coaching folks. So, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of preparation that needs to be done, certainly around questioning, but also, um, you know, practice, right? So it sounds like it, it, it can be a, a, a very challenging area to navigate if you're not fully prepared. So I'm just curious, like when you're out there coaching salespeople on questioning, where do you typically see people fall down? You know, what, what are they not doing right? You know, the, the thing that I see, and, and it's interesting, um, I see it shockingly, and it's going to be really controversial. Um, I see it, the more tenured I a seller is, the more prevalent I see this challenge, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I see is um, lack of pursuing questions like mm -hmm. this, this um, sort of acceptance of vague or ambiguous or surface level answers. And I, 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 you know, I'm nervous about, obviously that's a generalization. It is not true in every situation. Um, but generally what I see is the more experience we have, the more that we have been out there and engaged, uh, the more that time that we've spent, you know, sort of uh, knowing the ins and outs of our industry and our clients, the more we fill in the gaps ourselves with the hmm. information and that desire to be professionally curious really tends to wane. Um, and one of the biggest things that I find when I'm working with sellers is really coaching them with, you know, do you know that or are you assuming that? Mm. How did you know that? What did they say or do that indicated to you that they care about that, right? Like, let's, let's, let's replay this conversation to make sure that you're not inserting your own narrative into their story. And that can be really hard to do is to, to really tap into that um, desire to be curious. And look, I, I it happened, it, 
I think it's a pretty natural thing, right? Like I think about when my kids were young and how curious they are and how my curiosity seems to be waning quite a bit at this point in my life. And, you know, it's not something that I think we do naturally. It's mm. not intuitive and we have to practice being curious. Yeah. You, you use the term pursuing questions. So are you saying, you know, a, a, a customer answers a question of yours and there's something in there that's a little bit vague that you really should ask a few more questions to really get at what they're saying. And you're, you know, sometimes, particularly with tenured folks, they, they don't ask those, you know, more detailed questions to really get at it. Is that, is that what you're getting at? Yes, that's exactly it. And, and, you know, what, what they tell me is, well, I know what they're going to say, right? Like I've heard this before, I've seen this situation, or I know what happens when they're, when, you know, when the incumbent provider is X, it means this, you know, and so there is that um, sort of inability to parse out their assumptions from what the client tells them. Wow. Yeah. And, and I imagine too, you, you touched on this, you're partic particularly if you're somebody very tenured, you want the customer to see you mm -hmm. as somebody who is very knowledgeable, has experience, has done this, you know, quite a bit. And so, you know, it sort of leads you to, to making some of those assumptions rather than staying in that zone of being genuinely curious. Yeah. But, you know, you talked about another skill of prefacing, right. You know, and that's the balance, right? You can, right. you can, you can share some of your expertise and insight yeah. while leading into another, you know, deeper question to really stay curious about your customer, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great way to build your credibility, right? Like all you have to do is say, you know, in my experience and what I've seen with other clients is when they have done X, this has been the outcome. Tell me what experience you've had with this. Right. Right. Yep. Yeah. I, and I think like, people really respond well to that, you know, a little bit of information about what they're seeing out there and then, but making it personal to them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I know we you asked a while ago and I've you know, taken my sweet time to answer it. Um, <laughs> like, what am I seeing out there? And there's one more thing that I'm seeing um, that I would love for sellers to build their own self-awareness around, which is this phenomenon of stacking questions together. Right. Mm. Um, it feels like a press conference, right? Yeah. Like, like yeah. I'm competing with 75 different reporters. And so when I get my moment in the spotlight, I'm going to ask you 15 questions with the word and connecting each and every single one of them and pretend it was just one because that's all I've been allocated. You know? yeah. um, and it's, it's painful to watch. And so, you know, what I'd love to see and what we would coach sellers on all the time is get comfortable with the silence, right? Ask that one question and then quiet those voices in your head because we either continue to ask questions because we don't feel like the way we phrased it was clear enough. And so we rephrase it or ask these sort of, you know, additional clarifying points. And what we don't recognize we're doing is we're detracting from our own presence because we're sending the subtle message that we're not confident in our communication skills. There's nothing worse in my experience than watching somebody like out loud form their question and edit it and change it. And then you're supposed to answer it. I mean, it is just, it really is painful to watch. Oh yeah. I, I mean, I sit there and stare at them. And then my only answer is which question did you want me to answer? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is, it is about, uh, it's about preparing, right? Being yep. super prepared, but also I love what you're saying about being comfortable with silence. Even before you ask the question, give yourself a beat, right? To, to form it before it actually comes out of your mouth. Yeah. And you know what? Um, I get like sellers are under a lot of pressure. They're in high pressure situations all the time. And, you know, that deer in headlight feeling, especially, you know, you're nearing the end of the quarter or, you know, when you left the office to go for this meeting, you know, your leadership is like, man, we're really counting on this one, right? Like there's all yeah. this pressure. And and so to, to act in the moment, right? Like to have that presence of mind in the moment, it doesn't just happen because you decide it's gonna happen. So I always encourage people like find those no stakes environments to practice, right? So like practice at home or on the dinner table with your family, right? Yeah. Like practice in the grocery store with a random stranger while you're waiting to check out. These are the places that there's nothing to risk. But, you know, when you can develop that muscle memory of one question at a time and then comfort with the silence so that you can really listen, 
um, it's amazing how easily that will translate into a high pressure situation. Yeah, that's such a great suggestion. And let's actually, you mentioned the word listen. Let's let's uh, transition to that a little bit for a few minutes. It's sort of the other side of the coin, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we all, what does it actually really mean to listen? I mean, I know that sounds like a silly question, but I think a lot of people don't spend time really thinking about this skill. So when you when you talk about listening, Becky, I mean, let's break it down for the audience. What does that mean? Yeah, you know, it, it, so there's two things, right? There's content, but then there's emotional tone. Right. And content matters, but it's the smallest part of the meaning. Right. And I like so what I mean by that is, you know, I, I raise daughters and I can tell you like tone is everything, you know, yes. and, uh, you know, there's a big difference between I'm going to clean my room, mom, and I'm going to clean my room, mom. Right. Like <laughs> content, exactly the same meaning. Mm, pretty different. Right. Yeah. Like it's just not not the same thing at all. Um, And so when we're talking about listening, we're not just talking about replaying the words they said, but really tuning in on body language, tone of voice. What are they not saying? What do they keep circling back to? What is it they can't seem to move on from, right? Mm. What are their questions implying, right? We get a question, we're so Pavlovian, we answer it, right? But we really need to work with sellers to pause for a second and, and assess. Is that just a simple request for information or is that actually resistance or an objection disguised as a question? Right? Mm, like, yeah. There's so much to think about when it comes to listening. And, you know, I, I, I have to laugh about listening and I'm sure you'll appreciate this, Andrea, but, you know, at the end of any workshop or coaching session, I'll always ask somebody, okay, what's, what's one thing you're going to do differently? And, and, and invariably somebody says, I'm going to listen more. And I'm like, okay, that's great. How are you going to do that? And their answer to me is, well, I'm just, I'm going to listen more. I think. Let's put a plan, a little bit more of a plan around that. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, is that how this works? Like, <laughs> okay, look, um, I want to be a better tennis player. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to play better tennis. Yeah. Yeah. It's that easy. Yeah. yeah. Look for me at the open this year. I mean, <laughs> you know, I've just decided, right? Like, and that's the thing about listening. You know, it's not, we just think we either choose to listen or we don't listen. You know, we think that if we tell somebody, hey, you're not listening to me, then they can magically listen to you, right? Like, it just, it doesn't work that way. It takes discipline, it's intentional, and it takes practice. And I think, you know, if I could give people just one tip on how to become a better listener, uh, that one tip would be think about what a good listener looks like, right? We all know there are signs, right? Either they're using acknowledgement statements that incorporate your words, or they're asking relevant drill down questions, or they're taking notes, or uh, they're making eye contact. Doesn't matter. There's, There's a ton of signs that someone's listening to. You always know when someone's listening to you. And if you want to become better at listening, pick one of those signs and focus on practicing it, right? Mm -hmm. Think about it. If I want to be a better tennis player, I can't just play better tennis. I got to do drills, right? And those drills will all come together to make me a better tennis player. Think about like the visible signs of listening as the drills that you can deliberately practice, which over time will make you a better listener. Yeah, I love that idea. Uh, And maybe you know, if I can ask one more question on this topic of listening that might help people think about choosing one, one area to focus on. I mean, we all know we should listen, Becky, right? I mean, see, like we all know we should listen, but why, why is it so hard? <laughs> um, you know, uh, there's like, why isn't it right? Like, so, so Traditionally, it's external distractions, it's the talk inside of our head, um, and, you know, it could be internal distractions like hunger or something going on, right? Like, those are all the sort of textbook answers. Uh, But I also think we're being conditioned to consume information differently. Mm. You know, everything is bite-sized. Everything is in small bits. And I think about my own behavior, right? Um, I think about, you know, when I um, was growing up and we didn't have a lot of technology, you know, you could sit and watch a movie and not multitask, right? I never did anything else. I just watched a movie and it was great. You know, it was was awesome. Um, There's no way I have sat 
for 90 minutes or two hours without getting distracted and either looking at my phone or yep. checking my email or, you know, whatever it might be, that that ability to to stay focused longer. So I saw some data and I'm, I'm remiss that I cannot quote where I saw it. So please don't hold me to this. But I saw something that said that every two minutes we take 20 second mental vacations. Um, and oh. I have to say that statistic really surprised me. I think two minutes is generous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. yes. I think about like when I drive and I'm listening to a podcast and the minute a 30 second commercial comes on and then, you know, the, the podcast resumes, I have to back it up like five times because I realize, you know, six minutes down the road that I haven't been paying attention since the commercial started. Yeah. I just think that our ability to pay attention um, has changed. You know? Well, I, I totally agree. And I guess, you know, all the more reason then for people to, you know, sort of follow your advice here around, you know, work on the muscle, right? Like yeah. practice getting better at listening, because frankly, I think for salespeople, everything's kind of stacked against them when it comes to this, this particular skill, uh, yeah. you, you named a lot of them. So it's gonna, but man, you, you can imagine being more curious and being a better listener. That's gotta be some really great payoff for salespeople yeah. to invest in building those skills. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, again, if you go back to this whole idea of emotional intelligence and really recognizing that buying goes beyond logic, right? That doesn't mean we're saying throw logic to the wind and it's all about emotion. That's not true, you know, but but emotion is going to have a huge influence over the buying journey. Just being able to be curious and to really focus and hear your clients and help guide them through that journey. Sometimes the only thing that differentiates you from your competition is the experience you create. 100 percent absolutely becky and you know what i in closing i i i just want to say to you know anybody who's listening that i sure hope people take your advice around you know when it comes to questioning practicing and in you know low risk environments with family and using those skills that you talked about about you know pursuing and going a little bit deeper and drilling down and for listening you know pick one area where you can you can do a little bit better because i these do feel like skills that really have a, a ton of payoff. So Be Becky, thank you so much for sharing your insights today. I know listeners are going to find them helpful. And if you would like to connect directly with Becky uh, or reach out to her with any of your questions, you can find her on LinkedIn at Rebecca Cassily. That's two S's and two L's. And uh, thank you, of course, to our listeners for tuning in today. For more sales tips and best practices, please check us out on LinkedIn at Richardson Sales Performance. Thanks, Andrea.